Hello and welcome to the Fits and Healthy Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Lauren Fitz, joined by my beautiful co-host, Jessica Young. And today we have another beautiful guest who I just finished e-meeting because we have connected on Instagram but never met in person. Um, today's guest, who I'm super excited about, Dr. Gabrielle Fandero. And let me tell you, so first of all, thank you for being here, Gabrielle. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. And Jessica, how are you doing? Fan freaking tastic. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that matters. <laughs> um, so today's episode is all about gut health. And um, our guest today, actually, we connected by her just reaching out and saying, hey, I, I saw that you said something about artificial sweeteners and I wrote a post that you might want to check out. And um, I since then I've looked at her, her Instagram, her Instagram is legit full of amazing information. So I had to write down all of her credentials because mm -hmm. she legit has street cred. So she is an RP strength consultant, which we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. Cause I actually have never heard of Renaissance periodization, the, the company. So we'll talk about that. She's ISSN certified sports nutritionist. She's a certified health coach. Um, she holds just a PhD in human <laughs> nutrition, food and exercise from um, Un University of Virginia Tech, as well as her BS in exercise sports and health education from Radford University. Her research was in the relationship between keywords, gut bi microbiome and peripheral metabolism. Everyone, they, they hear gut biome and they hear metabolism. And they're like, oh, I need to listen to this episode. Yes, absolutely. Um, she speaks on everything from diet, exercise, microbiome and health to sports, nutrition, health coaching and low FODMAP diet. So today we're literally, we're just going to talk all things uh, gut health and metabolism and um, go from there. So Gabrielle, thank you for being here. Thanks again. That was quite the introduction. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm, I'm brushing up on my introductory skills. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, so I, I love the interwebs because they connect um, people that truly have a heart to help. And if you look at your Instagram, which is at vitamin PhD, um, and you guys make sure that you go check that out. We'll give a plug at the end too, but um, it's your your Instagram is just full of helpful information. And, um, and you know, we, we've been talking on Instagram and our DMS and, um, you and I agree on a lot of things and there's some things that we don't agree on. And I love the fact that we are two educated females who maybe don't see eye to eye on everything, but we both have the same heart to help people and give education. And so that's why I, you know, I told you yesterday in, in uh, messenger, like, I'm just looking forward to learning from you because I have no doubt that that Jessica and I can learn from you. Our listeners can learn from you. So today's today's topic is is really kind of a a buzzword, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm excited that we come from this angle of education. Um, I you know before I was an RP uh, coach, I was an assistant professor, and so that was. And I had worked up to that point, you know, for seven years, I knew I wanted to be a professor. I knew I wanted to educate. And so even though this is a different realm, that's still my core value is always to educate and always to empower people. Okay. So I'm just, tell the audience, I've done my research on you, but um, tell the audience a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. So um, like I mentioned, when I was a junior in undergrad, that's when I realized that I wanted to be a professor. And I had such a passion uh, and a fire about anatomy and physiology. And so I was like, okay, this is the area that I want to go into, specifically um, skeletal muscle physiology. That's what I was really passionate about. So when I started my PhD, I actually was looking specifically just at the interactions between a high fat diet and skeletal muscle metabolism. And that project actually, through a series of sort of unfortunate events, we lost those samples. Meanwhile, I had a, yeah, I was like, group projects. Oh it was my like, God. Of work. So, um, I can't even imagine. It was, it was, it was difficult. It was a tough day. Uh, yeah, there, there were some F bombs dropped on that day, let's just say. <laughs> oh, man. So, um, so yeah, I had the side project. Um, which would then become my main project. So the reason that I was so interested in the role of the gut and skeletal muscle metabolism 
was due to our sort of methods for um, challenging skeletal muscle in our rodent models. Okay. So we would inject mice with a substance called LPS or lipopolysaccharide. Okay. So that's an endotoxin. It's something that comes from the cell wall of specific types of bacteria, and it can bind to receptors of our immune system, and it can upregulate inflammation. So inflammation is sort of a buzzword. Now, normally, acute inflammation is a normal response to infection, to exercise. Um, it's something that we need to undertake, you know, multiple times throughout the day. But Absolutely. It needs to be, you know, regulated. Absolutely. So. In these mice, we would give them really super physiological doses, so very high doses of LPS. Okay. And then we would extract their skeletal muscle, and we would measure the way skeletal muscle would use either glucose or fatty acids. Cool. And that's a way that we could measure sort of the, its metabolic flexibility, so it right. should respond to whatever we feed it. Right, because those are our two main en energy sources yeah. as mammals. Exactly, exactly. And so we found that this LPS could dysregulate that metabolic flexibility. So the skeletal muscle couldn't readily switch between those fuel sources. Hmm. So I, of course, I want to get to the bottom of this. I'm like, why are we using LPS? And right. it was because, okay, well, it comes from the uh, intestines and, you know, it's upregulated um, theoretically during high fat feeding and um, obesity and uh, metabolic syndrome. So it's sort of a um, a comorbidity of having obesity or having type two diabetes. Okay. And I was like, well, we probably should then be looking at the gut. I mean, like, yes, it's important to look at the mechanisms behind how this dysregulation occurs, but I'm the type of person that wants to know everything about everything. So I was like, I want to get to the, the, the root. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Exactly. So I was like, Oh, I want to look in the gut and, and, and my PI was like, that's not really our area. Like, you know, kind of just focus. And I'm like, no, please just let me do something. And this so, is wait, this is how many years ago? Oh, this was, so I was maybe, this was my first year of grad school. So I was like 22, so it was 10 years ago. Okay. Okay. Before, <laughs> before, before the gut problem. health was so, yes. so yeah. commonplace and, I, and yes. buzzword. I'm a gut cool. health hipster, I guess. I love like, it. I love like, it. Like a scarf and glasses. You're um, you're a, you're a gut health professional for sure, right? Yes, yes, that's the term that I like to use. Yeah. So, um, I uh, we ended up having the opportunity for funding. Now, this was from a probiotics company, so I'm sure people would be like, "Oh my gosh, this is you know industry funded research." Right, like you're right. Super probiotic, but um, I wasn't super passionate about just the the probiotics aspect. I just right. wanted to see, you know, what's the link here? How does this actually happen? So my dissertation looked at the potential protective effects of probiotic supplementation during high fat feeding. Okay. And spoiler alert, anyone who has heard me talk about this um, on other podcasts, um, we see some, and we've seen this in humans, there's very modest protection. So we see some maintenance of insulin sensitivity and sometimes improved um, specific uh, cardiometabolic factors, like looking at changes in lipid levels. But overall, probiotic supplementation is a drop in the bucket and it's not going to prevent the development of obesity if we are eating a hypercaloric diet. Okay. Um, so, so that's where, that's kind of the background. Now, when I went on to teach, I went to a teaching focused college. So it was a right. four year college. Um, You're open access. legit academia. Yes, exactly. Time. Yeah. And I was like, I don't use anything with this gut microbiome stuff. Like no one talks about it anyway. No one knows what I'm talking about when I talk about my research. And so I focus just on really on teaching for four years. Now in my fourth year, that's when Dr. Mike Isratel from Renaissance Periodization found me um, through, again, just a series of, of it, my dad says luck is where preparation meets opportunity. So, you know, oh, I was prepared. I, love I was that. prepared. I know I love that too. So I was prepared for this opportunity, but Dr. Mike reached out to me actually via Facebook, um, because he saw that I was interacting with individuals on the ISSN Facebook page and I was putting out like tiny bits of content. I mean, I just had a blog. I was, you know, not right. known at all. Right. And so, um, started working with RP part-time while I was still teaching. And so that fourth year teaching, I had to kind of make this decision. Do I want to go ahead for another year and go up for promotion? Right. Or do I want to go into coaching full-time? Because right. that was incredibly fulfilling. And I loved, you know, I had a few speaking engagements at the time. So I was fortunate that I, you know, had the opportunity then to um, leave academia and then go into coaching full-time. And that's what I've been doing for the past, you know, a uh, year and a half. Um, traveling, speaking about the microbiome. Um, I wrote a chapter for the RP 
guidebook 2.0 on gut health. I'm writing another book now um, and coaching full time. So I work with RP and then I also do consulting um, through my own business. And that's specifically for individuals who have um, who face challenges with sort of long term digestive issues okay. and usually mm. concurrent with some form of dietary restriction. Maybe they've taken an IgG food sensitivity test, which are not valid. And they think that there's 800 foods that they can't eat. So they come to me having eaten six foods for the past six months, or, um, you know, they're confused about the tests that are being promoted. Maybe they've gone and done a breath test and gotten some confusing results. So I can consult with them as well to just provide education and really the most prudent recommendations um, that, that we can provide at the time, given how much we don't know compared to the little bit that we kind of think we know. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. If, if I've learned anything is that I don't know anything. Right. <laughs> I mean, right. <laughs> the more and more I read, whether it be, you know, research articles or a blog post from rec- Rep, uh, reparable sources. Um, it, regardless, I just feel like there's so much that I don't know and I'm constantly trying to learn. And and I feel like the gut biome is one of those areas that I'm just like, I think I know a little, but I think it's like 0.1% of what I, is actually, you know, to be understood about the gut biome. Yeah. So, yeah. so let's just talk for the average person because not mm-hmm. everyone that, um, that listens to this podcast wants to hear the geeky details, although yes. too bad yeah. you're going to get to hear the geeky details. <laughs> you speak English, <laughs> but but the fact is, like the the average. I mean, we have listeners from all over, but obviously mm-hmm. we're in America, so the average yeah. American, um, I'm guessing, probably has not the greatest gut health. And let's let's talk to the that person who, where do they start, and what do they need to know, and what do they need to do. Well, I think the first thing would be to um, emphasize that we don't have a specific profile for a healthy gut. Right. So that means that if we look at all of the microbes present in your gut and you're considered to be a healthy individual in the United States, your healthy gut will look significantly different from the healthy gut of a person in Korea or Japan or South America or West Africa, all healthy controls all significantly different microbial profiles. Right. So then the, what's the official definition of a healthy gut? There is not one. There is not one. There you go. So I think that's what we have to be really careful with is to um, not cause any sort of unnecessary fear or worry about whether or not a person has a healthy gut because we don't have a clear definition for a healthy gut. Right. Right. We don't even have a clear definition for dysbiosis, which is the term that we sort of use for a quote unquote unhealthy gut. Right. We have sort of an amorphous understanding that dysbiosis looks different from a healthy gut, but it's sort of like saying bad weather. Okay. So we've got kind of good weather. Oh, okay, cool. It's sunny. It feels nice out. But bad weather, well, that could be a lot of different things. And depending on where we are in the world, exactly. we have different types of bad weather, you know? Exactly. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Cold in Chicago is different than cold in Alabama. That's all I'm right. going to say, Keldrick. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that is exactly how dysbiosis looks from disease to disease. And even between two individuals who have the same disease. So there is not a cookie cutter. This is the no. type of gut that you should have. Right. Now, of course, people can look at gut health as sort of a comfortable gut function, but there's another bit of confusion there as well, because when those microbes are metabolizing nutrients, they might produce gas, they might produce some short-chain fatty acids, they change the environment, they change the inside of our intestinal tract. Now, they are having a heyday, they're just fine. They have a lot of fiber and all the energy that they need. They're doing great. But we then might experience gas and bloating and digestive discomfort. But that That doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that that that's a bad thing. Yes, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) All right. Yeah. So we want to find sort of, I think what most people want is they want to find a balance between um, microbes that have everything that they need and humans have everything that they need. And there's just a manageable amount of sort of gas and bloating and, you know, (laughs) realizing that these things are normal and that while we do have many correlations between 
um, this dysbiosis, and even sometimes specific microbes, we have not established any causal links. That means that we don't have a cause and effect established. We don't know what comes first. Is it changes to the microbiome or is it the disease that comes first? We've not been able to establish that in humans. And only have we been sort of able to establish a proof of concept in rodents. That means that we have some proof that this concept could be true, but we still have not proven it. Right, right. So that's mm -hmm. another thing that we have to be really aware of that. And then when we're trying to change the gut microbiome, when we look at long-term studies, even comparing um, fairly diverse diets, if we look at vegans versus omnivores versus vegetarians, long-term, about 60 to 80% of all of the microbes present stay stable they don't change at all really yes interesting and, and in many cases the microbiomes of of vegans versus vegetarians and omnivores really don't look any different huh and if they do we don't have characteristic patterns of the of the groups or taxa that will be increased or decreased with vegans versus omnivores so, so, so you, so basically we don't know shit. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. To sum that up for the layman. <laughs> no. So, but I, I, if a person comes to you and that they're wanting guidance, mm -hmm. what, how do you establish, okay, their gut health is relatively good, even though we don't have a, a secure definition, like you meet these criteria, check, you have good gut health versus there are definitely people that have jacked up gut health. So let's start there. Yeah, so that's going to be sort of um, person specific. Right. So if they come to me saying, I have a, a lot of gas and bloating and diarrhea, the first thing that I would do is have you gone to a gastroenterologist and you've yep. done all of the necessary medical tests to screen you for various diseases. If that's out of the way, okay, then – it's most likely due to something in their diet that is being processed by those bacteria and then causing some gas, some bloating, um, or some diarrhea. So we have to realize that um, when we are taking in sources of fiber, right. that fiber is not being utilized by us. It's actually passing all the way through to the large intestine. Fiber can pull water. It can be fermented. So it could cause gas, it could cause bloating, it could cause some diarrhea, it's sort of like a Goldilocks effect. We have too much or too little fiber. And depending on the fiber type, we could have diarrhea or we could have constipation. So that individual, um, most of the time, what I'll do is help them walk through some systematic process of elimination and reintroduction of foods that are most likely to cause some of those issues. So this is not a long-term elimination, get rid of these foods forever. This right. is just eliminate them and then reintroduce them in a systematic way so that we can test not only what they can tolerate, but the levels to which they can tolerate those foods. Okay. And then so, from there, we, we expand the diet. So is that the same thing for people who like, you have people say, you know, I'm always nauseous or every time I wake up, I don't feel good. And they went through all the doctor stuff getting the light put in their stomach whatever the case may be do you mm -hmm. think it's just um what they're eating because i know my like my mom for example she's really big on medicine and she'll be like you just need to take something for your stomach every morning just get up take a drum mean or something i'm like <laughs> but what is wrong that you have to take medicine oh, every Gloria. morning oh, Gloria. Morning. but you know mama old school yeah. but anyways she, <laughs> just take it every morning and then a coach your stomach but it has to be something you know that we're eating but i see that a lot especially in my family They're like i'm just always nauseous and don't really know why mm -hmm. well there are certainly other factors aside from food lifestyle factors like stress so we do have uh some rodent data showing that uh chronically elevated cortisol levels so that's a, a hormone associated with stress uh does have an effect on the microbial profile so that's certainly a possibility we also know that Things like cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, and yoga can actually help to reduce the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome. So those are all other mm. possible interventions. Yeah. So if we look at, I just take a food first approach before we look, well, food and lifestyle. So I'm like, right. are we managing sleep? Are we managing stress? 
Are we managing food? From there, if we've said, okay, all of those things are on point, then we can look at perhaps applying evidence-based supplements. And there are very few of those for the gut, but there are some strains of probiotics that might help. But I don't really advocate for a long-term use of medication without the advisement of a medical practitioner. So if Mm -hmm. a gastroenterologist says, hey, here's the medicine that you have to take all the time, absolutely take that all the time. But I think that, um, you know, if we do have something like that, like a continuous nausea or really extreme gastrointestinal uh, issues, we do want to make sure that we go to the doctor and get screened first, because Mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that sort of can fly under the radar. And people seem to almost resign themselves to like, this is just how I am because these are bathroom habits and I deal with them every day. And that becomes their new normal. Mm-hmm. So, well, I don't, um, I usually don't say, I don't, I usually wouldn't tell a person like you have good gut health or you have bad gut health because we actually, you know, <laughs> there are very few things that we see consistently change in response to dietary interventions. Now I can say, okay, consistently we've seen with a low FODMAP diet because it's low in fermentable fibers, we may see reductions in bifidobacteria. Okay, so so, we, so explain the low. I, I know the low FODMAP diet, yeah. but for the listeners who are not familiar with what FODMAP actually mm-hmm. stands for, it's an acronym. Could you explain that real fast? Yeah, so it's fermentable oligo dye and monosaccharides and polyols, and so that's just a mouthful for saying fermentable carbohydrates. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So these are carbohydrates that the microbes can use for energy. And when they do that, they're either producing gas or short chain fatty acids as a byproduct. And, and the gas, uh huh. And can you give the the listener some examples of some FODMAP foods? Yeah, yeah. So any like most of our soluble fibers are going to be fermented. Some of the most um, I don't want to say problematic, but the FODMAPs that would more likely cause some bloating and gas because they're so highly fermentable would be inulin. So we find those in chicory root, which is um, one that we see in a lot of diet foods. A lot. Uh, yeah. Onions, garlic, um, uh, uh, sorbitol we see in um, avocado. That's another one that people are eating a lot. Um, mannitol, we find that in mushrooms and cauliflower, um, fructose uh, at various doses. So fructose is, is pretty ubiquitous, but if we have fructose in excess of glucose, so really high fructose. Lactose is another one, obviously, we see in dairy. Um, galacto-oligosaccharides, so we find those in legumes. Right. So a lot of the foods that we think of you know, as, as sort of causing gas, so some of them are pretty obvious, so like beans, but then some mm-hmm. people just don't realize like apples and avocados are a couple that might cause some pretty severe bloating. Right. So um, those are all examples. So unfortunately it's a lot of, you know, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, foods that are very nutritious for us may just at certain levels cause some, some unpleasant gastrointestinal symptoms. So when we really reduce those in the diet, which is not recommended long-term, but it's part of the first phase of the low FODMAP diet, reductions in bifidobacteria. Now, that is considered to be a beneficial bacteria. We don't actually know the clinical outcomes. So how does it affect human health if we have this reduced short term? Right. We don't know what that is. So even though I can say, yes, this might have this effect on your gut, I can't then say, I'm going to change your microbiome or I'm going to remodel it or rejuvenate it or any, <laughs> anything. I don't actually make any claims about what I'm going to do to a person's microbiome. Right. I just give them the information about these are the mechanisms behind gastrointestinal distress, your diet, uh, your lifestyle. Here are some interventions that we can try that may lead to these outcomes. We have no way of knowing, even if we were to look at your fecal samples before and after, that just tells us what's going on in your fecal sample. It's actually significantly different from what's going on in your actual gastrointestinal tract. So um, that's, that's one thing that I'm kind of careful about is that I don't say things like, oh, you have good or bad gut health. I'm just looking at your lifestyle and your dietary practices. Right. Are they supportive of comfortable digestion? Are they perhaps including some foods or some practices that might cause some gastrointestinal upset? And that's really what I'm trying to address because our gut health looks so different in various parts of the world. And it's because it's, uh, it, it's sort of the uh, culmination of so many different factors, lifestyle, environment, all this stuff. So right, um, right. that's kind of the angle that I take. 
Nice. So okay. then obviously I, I know your take on food intolerance test. Can we talk about food intolerance tests versus some of the more um, popular tests that you can do? Like I'm sure you're familiar with Viome and a mm-hmm. few other tests like that. And I, I want to yeah. have you explain your, your opinion of them and your take and the evidence base behind that opinion. Yeah, yeah. So Viome is a little bit different from what we would look at for a food intolerance test. So um, the kind of the most common, I guess, like marketed to everyone on the internet food intolerance test would be the IgG, what they call a food sensitivity test. Right. So that's based on a specific antibody, an IgG antibody. And we have IgG antibodies that sort of identify uh, foreign substances in the body. And it is simply an identification antibody. It doesn't mean that we're going to mount an immune response to that. The antibody that would cause an immune response to be mounted, so an actual allergic response, would be IgE. So we do have IgE-mediated allergy tests, but there are those are the ones that we care about. The anaphylaxis. Yes, exactly. That's exactly. (laughs) Yes, that's what we want. So IgG food sensitivity tests, quote unquote, actually will just give you a list of foods that you have eaten at some point in your life. That does not mean that you have a food sensitivity to them, and really, food sensitivities don't exist. We have intolerances and we have allergies. So can you explain the difference to the listener? Because I loved loved your explanation of this difference because I think a lot of people completely are are confused when it comes to this understanding. Absolutely, yeah. So an allergy is an immune-mediated response. So that means your immune system is responding or attacking what it considers to be an infection, an invader. So we can have IgE mediated and we can also have non IgE mediated. Now, even if you were to have a test that showed that you had an IgE response to a food, that doesn't necessarily mean that you also will have an allergy to that. We have some level of IgE response to most things that are not body cells. Right. So and you still would want to work with a, a, um, an allergist or an immunologist on that. And this is this for those of you that are listening, this is the part of the immune system that we when I'm pre oping a patient to take them back to put them to sleep. I I care about true drug allergies or Mm. or latex allergies or food allergies that cause anaphylaxis, because that is your body's immune system mounting a reaction that literally could kill you. So yes. that's immune system mediated. Okay, keep going. Yes, exactly. Yep. <laughs> and when we have an intolerance, that means that we have an enzyme mediated inability to break down a food. So when we are taking in our nutrients, they come in big chunks. We call these polymers. And we have to break those polymers down to the smallest possible units. And we do that with enzymes. If we don't have the enzyme to break down that polymer, it won't be broken down to its smallest parts and it won't be absorbed in the small intestine. So instead it goes to the large intestine. And in some cases, it's not even that we have an intolerance. It's just that we don't make the enzyme. So that's the case with fiber. We just don't make the enzyme. But one thing that people probably would be familiar with would be lactose intolerance. So that's not- I was hoping you were going to go there. (laughs) Yes, yes. So this is different from a dairy allergy. So with a dairy allergy, it's our immune system responding to a protein in milk. Lactose intolerant is the lack of the digestive enzyme that would break down the sugar in milk. So that lactose then travels to the large intestine where the bacteria can break it down. And then that's Bad why we, stuff yes, happens. Exactly. <laughs> we got the bubble guts and things like that. Bad. Yes, yes. I think so, I heard this at one time that by the age of three, like 87% of humans have lost that enzyme, that lactase enzyme. Mm-hmm. It actually is pretty normal, to, but but the other thing is that our lactose tolerance actually fluctuates over time. So we may be more or less lactose tolerant. So we could lose lactose tolerance if we have any damage to what we call the brush border. So that's the enzymes that are covering the intestinal cells. We may lose it over time just as a function of age, and we may lose it based on ethnicity as well. So depending on our ancestors, whether they had domesticated and used um, milk from cattle, or not, that is also going to increase or decrease our uh, chances of maintaining lactose tolerance over time. Huh, okay. We'll be right back to the Fits and Healthy podcast after this commercial break. Hey, this 
This is Jamie Lindbergh, host of Upbeat Urbanism, a podcast where we seek to have an open dialogue about what it takes to create healthy, intentional, sustainable communities, one conversation at a time. Each episode is an interview with a city planner, leader, developer, real estate professional, or community builder. To listen, search for Upbeat Urbanism wherever you find podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at UUrbanism and on Facebook at Upbeat Urbanism. Devote yourself to your community around you and devote yourself to creating something that gives you purpose and meaning. Until then, keep it upbeat. Hey, this is your boy Frog. I'm here with Chris, Justin, and Philip, and we host Turn On The Game, the podcast. The show consists of four men commentating on the sports world. It's strictly opinion show. It's as if you were sitting on the couch watching a game with your boys. And you can follow us on Twitter at TurnOnThe underscore game. You can hit us up on our Facebook page at TurnOnTheGame. And you can even follow us on Instagram at TurnOnTheGame. Or you can listen to us on Podbean, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher by searching Turn On The Game. You can email us at TurnOnTheGame, the number four at gmail.com. Turn on the Game is sponsored by Blackened Studios, Oklahoma City's premier podcasting studio. Turn on. And now back to Fits and Healthy. Now, so we we have someone who has this belief that their their food allergy test, all of these foods, they can't eat anymore. Yeah. What do you tell a person that that has that belief? Yeah. Well, first, I would definitely empathize because I know how it feels to wonder what is going on. Like I was diagnosed with IBS 10 years ago and it was like, oh, my gosh, like my stomach was just a mess all the time. And it is a a huge quality of life issue. Absolutely. Um, And then, you know, generally speaking, when they come to me, they have realized that they're not really getting a great response from having eliminated these foods. They still have issues. Issues. Yes. So from there, um, you know, I'm fortunate they're, they're usually very receptive to trying something different. And that's when I'll explain to them the physiology, the science behind an IgG food sensitivity test versus an allergy versus an intolerance and then gauge where they want to go from there. If they want to go through, you know, the FODMAP elimination, we have a, a couple different iterations of doing that depending on a person's um, dietary history. Or are they interested in just expanding their current diet to see how well they tolerate some of those foods? Now, what can happen is that a person, um, by chance, eliminates those FODMAPs when they eliminate from based on an IgG test. So they may right. actually feel better, but the problem there is that now they are not expanding their diet once again. Mm. So that could have effects on the microbiome and what we've seen, even though we don't really know the clinical outcomes yet, but... Um, it's fairly reproducible that if we have a long-term low fiber diet, that does lead to a loss of some of those beneficial microbes and a reduction in diversity over time. Mm -hmm. So that could potentially be problematic because a loss of diversity, like when we talk about, you know, the, uh, the gut of, of people in the U S versus the gut of people in other parts of the world, there's a theory that actually individuals in the U S overall have sort of dysbiosis right. because we have less diversity compared to individuals who eat a much higher fiber diet in other right. parts of the world. I, I was about to say, it's probably because the American diet has way less fiber than compared to diet mm-hmm. pretty much anywhere else in the, the world. Our, our fiber intake average is terrible. Yes. Yeah. We're, we take in about 15 to 19 grams per day. Um, the recommendations for, for females would be 25 and for males is 38. Now, when we, they compare our guts to individuals, for example, um, in West Africa, who are eating upwards of 100 to 150 grams of fiber per day or in rural parts of South America, they actually have microbes that we don't have at all in our gut, which is pretty interesting. Wow. Okay. Well, so- since we're talking about fiber, mm-hmm. um, how many times do you think you should poop, as I call it, doo-doo? How many <laughs> Um, what's a healthy, like how many times a day should you really be going? It looks like the normal range is anywhere from three times a day to three times a week. Um, and then within that, it it should be comfortable. So, um, you know, I don't provide diagnostic criteria or anything like that, but if you are finding that most of the time you have diarrhea or most of the time you're straining really hard to have a bowel movement, that would be reason to go to the doctor. So it's okay if you go like three times a week. Yeah. That's still within the normal range. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) 
<laughs> so I cannot I imagine I, only going three times a week. I That's thought I had a poop problem, but I, <laughs> but you're good. You know, I'm good. <laughs> you're good. You're good. You're good. <laughs> so, okay. So you have a person who is like, okay, I, I think that, that I've got, I've got some issues. I'm going to try this low FODMAP diet, mm -hmm. which is only supposed to be temporary. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden their GI symptoms start to get better. What's the next step that you, that you have them do? Because it's, it's a three-step process for them yes. when you put them on the, a low FODMAP diet, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So there are, as I mentioned, a couple different iterations. So depending on a person's history, we may not do the um, sort of strict traditional uh, elimination. We may do what's called an expanding FODMAP diet. So you actually are increasing the number of low FODMAP foods in the diet and sort of leaving everything that they've been doing alone. So if a person has a history perhaps of some disordered eating habits um, or a lot of fear around food and maybe some orthorexia, it's kind of maybe not the best approach to say, okay, now we're going to eliminate all these things and here's this selective list of foods you can choose from. Um, so the second phase can look a little bit different, but the traditional uh, reintroduction uh, and there's no really one specific way of doing this. It's just what Monash has sort of developed or recommended is that you would do a three-day testing phase okay. of one FODMAP at a time. So we usually start with lactose, or excuse me, we usually start with fructose. Okay. It's a single monomer. It's very easy to test. We use honey as the uh, test food for that. That's one of the recommended test foods because it's almost purely fructose. Right. So you start with what we would consider to be a low FODMAP serve. So that means that most individuals would be able to, pretty much everyone can tolerate this. It's very low in actual fructose because the amount is so small. And right. then you move to a moderate and then to a large serving, days one, two, and three. You have the person track their symptoms. They would want to keep a symptom log of their gas and their bloating. Now, if they have really severe symptoms on day two, they don't have to go to day three. They just like, that's their cutoff. So it really is client led. They, okay. I tell them, you know, whenever you want to stop testing, you stop testing. These symptoms are based on your um, threshold. So some people are like, no, I have a little bit of bubbles. It's okay. Right. Then you do uh, two to three days of washout between that test and the next one. So the next one is generally going to be lactose because it's a, um, a disaccharide. So two sugars stuck together, still fairly simple. And right. we move through that systematically all the way up to the galacto oligosaccharides, which are a fairly complex FODMAP. Right. And usually are more likely to, to cause some pretty significant symptoms. Right. Um, and so that process can take several weeks, uh, depending yeah. on how, you know, how many days of testing you get through. And then if they have to like travel and things like that, I usually will recommend pause because we want to make sure that all of the variables possible are controlled. Absolutely. So once we get through that testing phase, now they have a really useful reference range for each of the FODMAP groups to say, oh, I can actually eat... Um, sorbitol containing foods with no issue at all. So that's a whole group that I know I don't have to watch out for. Whereas maybe it's inulin, and this is one of the more common, um, you know, really problematic fiber types right. that they that they say, okay, that one's really going to upset my stomach. I'm just going to limit my intake of garlic and onion and then feel great. But sometimes if you look at a person's diet and they're eating like two foods that are high in FODMAP, you just go, okay, well, let's just remove those two and then test them back in. Right. And we can even test them in at you know, a third, a half, and one full of the amount that you would normally eat. Okay. And so anecdotally, I have had one client whose only issue was apples. She was eating oh. like four apples a day. Oh, hell. <laughs> and, and so I was like, you know, there's really not a lot going on here. Like most of the diet, like we could actually increase, you know, probably your intake of some fruits and veggies and, you know, increased dietary diversity. But this right now is really the only thing that seems to be problematic. So it was the only thing that we had to look into. Lo and behold, you know, we found the uh, amount of apple that she could tolerate and then um, her bloating subsided and she felt great. And so nice. the, the third phase of that is really focused on expanding the diet back out and getting as many um, FODMAP containing foods back into the diet as we can. Right, right. So then let's go back to Viome. Are, uh, are yeah. there ever patients or clients that you think that a test like Viome, because obviously te the Viome is not testing for intolerances. It's, right. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So those are really fun <laughs> tests, sort of like the, um, like 23andMe, or like if you get your, like embark your dog DNA tested. Um, so it can, 
tell you a little bit about your fecal microbiome. And what we can also do is just kind of look at the literature and say, okay, well, what's your, what are your dietary habits? Right. I can probably guess what taxa or what groups of bacteria are going to be enriched in your feces, just okay. looking at your dietary and lifestyle habits. Right, right. Um, so it's fun, but it's not a diagnostic test. It is not diagnostic criteria. We have to realize that we have some significant limitations there. For one thing, as I mentioned, if we're looking at the fecal microbiome, it is significantly different from what we would see along the small intestine and most of the large intestine. Right. It's fairly representative of what we see in the distal colon. So that's the the edge of your the the end of your large intestine. Right before the rectum. Right, right before the rectum. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just wanted to say that word. It's a great word. <laughs> it's a great word. But, it is. But it's also really specifically representative of what we call the luminal content. So if you think of your intestines like a hose, the lumen mm. is the center of the hose where the poop flows yep. through. But we also have the mucosa. So the mucosa, is the, that refers to the intestinal cells and the protective mucus layer. There are mucus-associated microbes that really don't come out in that fecal sample. Mm. And they're arguably a little bit more important because those are the ones that are so close to the intestinal cells and all of the immune cells beneath. So we're missing entire segments of the gastrointestinal tract. And even when we take a cross-sectional view, just looking at the difference between the mucosa and the lumen, those populations are actually significantly different as well. So hmm. that fecal sample is really a fecal sample. You can do some things to modify your fecal sample. Like you can take probiotics. Right. You will actually see enrichment of probiotics in the fecal sample, regardless of whether they have actually enriched the gut or not. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And it is just also a snapshot. So it's just right. what's going on right now. It's kind of like an EKG versus a 48 hour halter monitor. EKG yes. only gives me what the heart is doing at that moment in time versus mm -hmm. a 48 hour halter monitor tells me exactly what the heart's doing for a, an extended, you know, two day period. So yes, exactly. Yep. Yep. And you only can, can get so much information. Yes. Yeah. And you could even take it a step further and it's kind of more like listening with a stethoscope for, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for a second versus, you know, 48 hours. So right, absolutely. right, right. Yeah. It's a very indirect measure. And, um, you know, we, we really stress that it's not a clinical test. It's not a diagnostic tool. And sometimes, you know, people will be concerned because they see some pathogenic strains of bacteria and things like that. But it's actually normal to have pathogenic bacteria. And if we're looking, you know, we can think of this uh, microbial community. It's like an ecosystem. So we can look at ge very general classes like plants versus animals. And then we can look at specific types of animals like mammals. We can look even more specifically um, dogs versus cats. When we're looking at those fecal samples, quite often we're missing what's at the subspecies level. And that's where things really matter. This is like looking at the difference between a dog and a dingo. Right. Dogs you want to have as a pet. Dingoes, probably not. Probably not. <laughs> so there are... Dingo ate specific. my baby. Yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. So it's it. like if you have E. coli in your gut and people are like doing, you know, an E. coli cleanse or a yeast cleanse, there are actually probiotic, there are beneficial strains of E. coli and there are pathogenic strains of E. coli. Mm. Mm. Yeast play a very important role. Methanogens play an important role. So we have more than just bacteria in there. We want to have more than just bacteria in there. And the way in which we are identifying them, so like what area of their genes we're looking at, yeah. that can also impact the results that we get in those tests as well. Right. So there's yeah, so there, there's so many layers. To, so you know. many layers. <laughs> okay, yeah, so yeah. so here's a question. I, I'm currently, I just got a continuous glucose monitor and I'm about to do an experiment. And mm -hmm. I'm about to do a, a three-day experiment on the different diets, right? So I'm going to start mm -hmm. off with the SAD diet, the standard American diet. Ah, I'm just yep. going to, because I'm going to California and I'm going to eat whatever the hell I want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to see exactly what my blood glucose does. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to go to a low-fat diet. So the, basically mm -hmm. what the government government has recommended us do for the last, you know, how many decades. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to try a vegan diet and then a high fat, low carb, then a keto. And then, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to show what my body does with a, a water fast. What are your takes on the different kinds of diets? And obviously they're going to affect my blood glucose differently, but mm -hmm. how do you think that they will affect my, my gut biome and my, my gut health? 
Well, depending on the resolution that you're using to um, test. So if we're looking at like big picture, just changes in what we call um, phyla, it's like looking at vertebrates versus invertebrates, mm -hmm. you probably, you might not see anything at all. If you look all the way down to maybe the strain at subspecies level or species level, you might see some changes. So this is also how we can make it look like diets do nothing or diets do so much. Right. We have to realize there are thousands of species in the gut. So it's like if we change two, even if we change them appreciably, it doesn't really matter out of thousands. You know? Right, right. I mean, maybe, maybe not. I'm not saying it does or doesn't. I'm just saying we don't know. Right, right. So um, there have actually been some interesting human studies just on short-term dietary interventions. And one that was pretty characteristic was done, I want to say, in maybe 2009. Um, and they put individuals on five days of a uh, plant-based diet, so a vegan diet versus one that was just uh, maybe it wasn't even keto. It was maybe carnivore plus cheese. So it was just meat gotcha. and cheese <laughs> okay. versus plant-based. Now, the individuals who went on to the plant-based diet really didn't see significant changes in diversity, probably because, you know, they were already eating some microbe accessible carbs, and right. now they're still eating microbe accessible carbs, no big deal. Now, the individuals who switched to that uh, meat and cheese only diet saw significant changes in diversity from baseline. So diversity re uh, refers to the number and then also the relative abundance of right. species. So we, we kind of look at it like, um, you know, a pie chart. So we can look at, the, is the pie chart getting bigger or smaller? Do we have more or less species? Right. And then what, how are we dividing that pie chart up? So do we have an overabundance of some pathogens that could potentially be bad? Or do right. we have a higher abundance of, you know, neutral or beneficial? That's generally a good thing. Right, right. So they saw significant changes in the people who ate that uh, meat and cheese diet. Now, not all of the bacteria, though, can be always considered good or bad. Right. That was going to be my next question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's very context dependent and also looks like it's all, it's based on sort of the backdrop of the rest of the microbiome. So each one of these microbes is interacting with its environment. So all of the other organisms around it. And what microbes do is they do something called quorum sensing. So they, they count how many of my brethren are out there. And if it's a high amount and it's a pathogenic organism, they might say, oh, there's a lot of us here. We could overcome the host immune system. We should go ahead and express virulence factors. Right. Whereas if they look around and they're like, oh, not a lot of us. And the beneficial and, and uh, neutral microbes are producing um, antibacterial compounds and outcompeting them for nutrients and stuff, they kind of just lay low and they're like, oh, I'm not going to do anything. So we can't say that just the presence of a microbe is a problematic thing. Right. And in some cases, even though they may correlate with um, disease states, it doesn't mean that they cause the disease state. So one right. example would be um, bacteroides. We often see that associated with like a high fat, high animal protein diet. Well, that could that diet itself could potentially lead to issues down the road. Right. Bacteroides isn't necessarily a bad guy. He's just very dynamic. He just can respond to changes in nutrient availability. Whereas bifidobacteria that we're like, yeah, he's a good guy. He's a probiotic. He's so finicky that if we don't have enough fiber in the diet, he's like, peace, I'm out. Like, there's I'm nothing out. for me here. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So that's what we can, you know, we see like, yes, there are changes that happen in as little as, as, as soon as the sort of the dietary changes get to the large intestine. So that can take, you know, a day or two. That's when we start to really see changes in the microbial community, but we don't know what those clinical outcomes might actually be. And when we look long-term at sort of the dietary extremes, you might find that if you go on a diet with no fiber, Right. And, and no like microbe carnivore. accessible. Yes, exactly. Or and, and no access microbe accessible carbohydrates. Then you could probably see appreciable changes in in diversity. So probably a loss of diversity. And also those microbes um, have been shown to actually reduce that protective mucus layer because that's a source of carbohydrates for them. Right. So right. instead of using dietary carbohydrates, they turn instead to that mucus layer. And that could be problematic. We may also see a reduction in, in the production of those beneficial short chain fatty acids like butyrate and propionate because they do need to have fibers. Um, they, they prefer fibers to make those. So they can, in some cases, metabolize amino acids, but they really, really prefer to have a carbohydrate source. Right. So if right. you're doing each of these, you know, for a day, you probably won't see huge changes. Right. You might see some shifts. And then once you get back to your habitual diet and lifestyle, 
whatever changes occurred are really just going to revert back to your normal right. baseline. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's definitely no way to show long-term effects on the gut health um, doing this little experiment, yeah. <laughs> really just to teach them about blood glucose and insulin and whatnot. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but so I, I'm just curious if, because we do know that there are good bacteria versus bad bacteria, mm -hmm. right? The, the whole probiotic thing. And mm -hmm. then the prebiotic is really just the energy that they consume, right? Yes. And yep. so what are your thoughts on good bacteria that people should be eating, whether it comes from food, from supplements or whatnot? And then I want to talk about prebiotics as well. Yeah. Um, well, the the real applications like the quality applications of probiotics so these are the organisms that an individual might ingest and yes. previous definitions really emphasized that they were live microorganisms now we know they might not necessarily have to be live if they're spore forming right. um so these are organisms that a person would ingest it could be bacteria could also be yeast okay. to confer some benefit the problem is that when we look at the actual impact of probiotic supplementation, um, it doesn't seem to be super effective for most things that people would hope, like right. like weight loss. You right. know, like it's not going to help with that. Now, where we do see some specific applications would be in diarrhea, so antibiotic associated, um, traveler's diarrhea, and pediatric diarrhea. There are a couple different strains of probiotics um, that actually seem to reduce the symptoms of diarrhea. We actually have also seen some benefit as an as an adjuvant treatment. That means in uh, addition to traditional treatment for inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and colitis, uh, modest benefit for symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome. But for the rest, um, it really seems to be kind of up in the air. We either don't have enough confirmatory trials, so that means that we have some that show benefit and then a bunch that show no benefit. And so our net of zero like evidence, you know, because if you have one that right. says yes and one that says no, I mean, you kind of have to look and evaluate how well those studies were done. But I would say the the most um, beneficial that we've seen repeatedly would be S. boulardi. That's actually a yeast, it's not a bacteria. Um, and that seems to be really helpful for um, uh, diarrhea. Um, uh, Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG seems to be especially helpful for pediatric diarrhea. There are a couple strains of bifidobacteria and then um, VSL number three. Now, I think the formulation may have changed. That's a multi-strain probiotic that seems to be fairly beneficial for inflammatory bowel disease. But it's important to note that these are, these are strain-specific effects. And so there's no such thing as a kitchen sink probiotic to take every day. And in fact, when we look so at- So I assume healthy, that you do not take a probiotic no, supplement yourself. No, I don't, yourself. no. No, the only time that I take a probiotic supplement is if I, so if I'm traveling internationally, um, I think that there is enough support for S. Boulardi to go ahead and take that. And um, you have a particular when, brand you like? Uh, no, I don't do any sort of brand specifics. So I just tell people, find an S. Boulardi, they're out there. All right, all right, <laughs> fair <Yeah>. enough. <laughs> um, uh, so that's that's really what I'll do. Um, but, you know, there's no kitchen sink probiotic. And then when we look at the effects on healthy individuals, so a healthy individual who has had no antibiotic challenge and nothing else is going on, um, when they take a probiotic, there are, uh, uh, this is reproducible. Nothing happens, literally, mm. like no, no change in gene expression, no change in- Save your yeah. money. Yes. you And so, like I mentioned, you might see an enrichment in your fecal sample. That does right. not necessarily mean that anything happens. <laughs> Right, Some right. individuals may actually be resistant to enrichment with probiotic supplementation, which is not a bad thing. So one of the sort of um, hallmarks of quote unquote gut health would be resistance to perturbation. So like you don't want absolutely everything to you eat and do to completely change the whole ecosystem of your gut. Right. You know, right. think about all of like maybe people are washing their produce and stuff before they're eating them, like, you know, apples and things that, you know, but maybe we don't so think of like all of the stuff that's on an apple that you get from a supermarket or something like that or even just like on your food from a restaurant we want to resist what's coming in <laughs> like absolutely. that's our first line of defense absolutely um, and then there was a really elegant study done uh last year or maybe a year and a half ago that showed that after antibiotic uh uh dosage individuals who took a lactobacillus containing probiotic actually had delayed reestablishment of their previous microbiome. So it looks hmm. like 
probably the best things that you can do. Now you could do uh, what we call an autologous fecal transplant. So you could ingest or have an enema of your own fecal matter from before. The I'm going to pass on that. Yeah, probably most people don't want to do that. Nope. Um, but the other thing was just the, the, just wait, just go back to your normal routine, you know, assuming that your normal routine is that you manage stress, you sleep, you exercise to some extent, and you have a diet with micro accessible carbohydrates, right? If that's not the case, then I would recommend go ahead and start doing that. You don't necessarily have to supplement with a probiotic. You don't even have to supplement with prebiotics because we get those in whole grains, fruits, vegetables, and legumes. So like, you can save your money on that $30 whatever supplement you were going to take and buy $30 worth of fruits and vegetables. Nice. Nice. I, I feel like I have, I could literally talk to you for probably a good three or four hours. <laughs> I might have to bring you back for part two of because, Absolutely. because we know I've got health. I, I have a feeling that this, this podcast is going to create a lot of questions and a oh, lot yeah. like, well, yeah. wh- why didn't you ask her this? So I might have to bring you back on. Uh, Cause there's so many other, like, I wanted, I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, prebiotics and, and fiber. Um, I wanted to talk about the, the mental health aspect mm-hmm. of our connection with the, the gut biome. And um, there's yeah. so many other things that I, I would like to talk about to you because you are one of the the well-known people in this, this uh, world of, of gut health. Um, if, So we have to wrap it up because we're running out of time. But if you could give um, the listeners just three quick take home easy points that Mm -hmm. would help them in their gut health, what would they be? Yeah. So um, assuming that you have met with your doctor, if there's anything going on, if you are just feeling good and you just want to do things that we know are associated with overall positive health outcomes that may also affect the gut, it would be to eat plants with every meal, to get regular physical activity and to spend time in the sun with loved ones and sleep and manage your stress levels. <laughs> and notice none of those things are any like things that you can make money off of. But <laughs> <laughs> but but truly like they're they're stuff that you can do for free, you know, and, yes. and they're they're lifestyle things that exactly. and and that's the the point I, I make to anyone is like don't waste your money on supplementation if you haven't addressed all of these other things. I, I do believe that there's a place for supplementation, but more times than not, all of those other things that you just listed haven't been addressed at all. And those play the biggest factor. So instead of spending $50 on a bottle of probiotics, um, get your sleep in check, which mm-hmm. costs nothing yeah, and, yep. and affects everything. Yeah. Well, okay. So tell our listeners where they can find you. Yeah, so um, uh, on Facebook and Instagram at Vitamin PhD. I also have vitaminphdnutrition.com, which is really um, just a website where they can get in touch with me or look at my previous podcast. <laughs> I don't have a huge, I don't have a huge social media presence, um, but those are the places, and um, you know they can always, I always answer DMs and emails and whatnot. So contact me there. Um, and if they're interested in coaching through Renaissance Periodization as well, for more just, you know, weight management, sport performance, they can find me on uh, RenaissancePeridization.com. Yeah, y'all should check out her Instagram because she like legit has been, you know, in the, the figure competition world. And, and she's she's been there, done that, trained for those kind of competitions. And so she coaches people, not just that want to do that, but coaches people in all, all aspects of health and, and, and wellness. So yeah. um, I appreciate you so much. Jessica, do you have any last words? words i do not do you have a mantra that you would like to to share with us today um i don't have a mantra but i do have like a little saying of the way i felt after this podcast tell me how that 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 goes um yes it's something that i've seen and i thought it would be really nice to share okay the surest way to prevent yourself from learning a topic is to believe you already know it oh. and today that i learned that i know nothing at all <laughs> <laughs> you are not alone trust me <laughs> so that's all i have for today I, I, that is that i very- learned a lot now i learned a lot but I just really know nothing at all. Well, and and I I think it's really it's it's key. I mean, both both of us realize we have our biases, but we're both open-minded to okay, maybe my biasy is not founded in 
good science, right? So the, the fact is that none of us know everything and constantly trying to learn um, how that we can become our best versions for ourselves is, is ultimately right. what all three of us are trying to do in this world. So um, so we like to end this the episodes with uh, a few sayings. Uh, in the beginning, we always said you are a good person and you deserve good things to happen to you. But I also added uh, in the second rendition that you deserve to love the life that you're living. And I do believe that it's by changing all of those things that we, we were talking about earlier that, you know, have nothing to do with spending money on supplements or whatever it's it's really it's just getting back to the basic fundamentals of 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 every human so we thank you so much gabrielle for joining us dr vendero thank you Uh, and um and thank you guys for listening if this episode was helpful i need you to do me a favor i need you to go subscribe i need you to leave a review on itunes because that helps us get the word out and it gets it more searchable um and then share it with loved ones you guys the there are so many people that would benefit from this episode and all the other episodes that we do so sharing is caring and until next week actually we won't see y'all live next week because next week's thanksgiving but we'll Mm -hmm. see you the week after that but have a fits and healthy day see you later bye bye Fits and Healthy is a podcast brought to you from the creative minds of Jessica Young and Lauren Fitzgerald. Make sure to follow, like, subscribe, and add to your playlist on Podbeam, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and Spotify. New episodes drop every Friday. I appreciate your time listening so much. If you enjoyed this episode of the Fits and Healthy podcast, can you please go do me a favor and go subscribe at whatever platform that it is that you listen to podcasts. Leave a review. We read every single review and we appreciate the time that you take to leave your thoughts and opinions. Now, also remember, while I am a medical doctor, the information I provide here is not intended to provide medical advice or a professional diagnosis, opinion, treatment, or service is to you or to any other individual. I am providing general information for educational and informational purposes only, and it is not a substitute for medical or professional care. You should not use this information in place of a visit, call, consultation, or the advice of your physician or other healthcare provider. The information I share is not intended to treat, cure, or diagnose any disease or medical condition. If you believe you have a medical emergency, just call 911 immediately or your physician. Now, enough of that medical legal jargon. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. I appreciate your time. Now go live a fit and healthy life.